Tim, would you introduce yourself? Tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Well, it doesn't fit on a business card really easily, so I'll just make it simple. I'm a, I'm a writer and an activist and an educator uh, focusing on anti-racism and, and, and race relations issues, institutional racism, white privilege, um, discrimination, and I've been doing that work for about 20 years, about 15 years of going around the country, speaking to different groups, doing seminars, workshops, trainings, lectures. Uh, I have written five books on issues of race and racism. So um, I, I guess you know the, the proper description is writer slash educator, um, but also potentially activist, depending on how you look at it. Good. We have a wide audience that will be looking at this interview. Um, a lot of them that will be educators, though. And so I have a couple questions that will be kind of geared toward them. The first one being, if I'm a young undergraduate educator preparing to be a teacher, why is this important? Why should I know the information that you share in your books and conferences? Well, I think, I think if you're going to try to teach in this country, um, e even 30 years ago, but certainly today and certainly 20 or 30 years from now, you're going to have to understand the way that race and color affect the experiences of the students who you're going to be teaching. And the reality is color has consequences. And if color has consequences, we cannot afford to be colorblind and ignore what those consequences are. So for example, I mean, there have been some studies uh, not all that long ago, a few years back, that found that students of color, for example, um, report needing positive feedback from teachers more readily than, let's say, white students. Now, the reason for that is pretty obvious if you're a black or brown kid in this country. You're getting hit with negative stereotypes, negative imagery. So you need something to sort of counterbalance that. Otherwise, you assume that a lot of people look down on your potential, don't assume you're capable. So if teachers go into that classroom treating everyone the same, and if the same means not giving positive feedback or giving the kids what you might need as a white teacher, since most teachers are white, or giving the kids what your own children might need as a white teacher, you're going to underserve the needs of those students of color. They need to know that you believe in them. They need to know that you actually see them as capable, intelligent, um, uh, amazingly smart folks. And, and that's the kind of thing that a lot of young white teachers in, in particular overlook because they're, they're being so colorblind that they're not thinking about the way that color is affecting the lives of those children. Hmm. Yeah, good. Um, we're certainly dealing with the th phenomena now of white flight. I, I think we've always been dealing with it, but it seems that you know we're in this era now of hypersegregation, which seems to result from white flight. Um, a lot of districts out there have flipped in relatively short periods of time, but what doesn't change immediately is the teachers in those schools. Right. The, the you know the students go from being ninety nine percent white to 80% Hispanic right. or 80% African American. What do those teachers need in order to be more effective right. with the students that they now teach? Well, they need to have really ongoing professional development around issues of not just diversity, which is often very surface level, but real equity education. I mean, the reality is, you know, you have what three or four in service days a year at most uh, school systems, and that's fine. But that doesn't really give you enough. You've got to have more ongoing training. You've got to have the professional development in the summer, for which I think teachers should be paid. I mean, it's work. It, you know, it's really learning. It's like going back to school. Yeah. Uh, it means that you've got to have teacher ed programs that are going to focus on that. You know, I, I speak to teachers all around the country, and some of them certainly have taken classes on these issues, and they've been exposed to these materials, and a lot of them haven't been. And even the ones who were, it was almost always voluntary. It was an elective class. Um, so they might have taken multicultural education as a requirement, but it didn't really delve into anti-racist pedagogy or anti-racist technique. And it wasn't teachers didn't want to learn that stuff. They were open to it. It's just that it wasn't there for them. And so when you don't get exposed to the material, the odds are you won't know it. I always joke about how, you know, I'm ignorant about calculus because I didn't take it. The reason I didn't take it is because I wasn't required to take it. Had I been forced to take calculus, I'd probably know it at least a little bit right now. Same thing is true with this kind of issue. If you're a teacher and you've never been required to know the experiences of the students who are going to be in your care, especially when those numbers, as you said, have flipped, the odds are you're not going to know what to do. The idea that you can do the same stuff you did when that school was 90% white or 99% white and overwhelmingly upper middle class uh, is, just, is just folly. And all the educational research says that you have to adapt to the demographic changes and you have to understand the experiences of the people who are going to be sitting in front of you. But I want to go back to this colorblindness because yeah. this is what you what I hear all the time when I'm out in the field working with right. with these teachers. They're they're going to claim they're just children. Right. How do we counter that? Well, I mean, you know, first I always I, I've done these interesting sort of 
I won't say experiments, but somewhat like experiments where I've gone and I've talked to, to, to teachers, particularly young teachers, and I've asked them this question. And I've said, you know, tell me the demographics of the kids in your class. And, uh, you know, what's the racial makeup? And, and a lot of times the young teachers, particularly the white ones, refuse to answer or they, they can't answer. They sort of pretend like, oh, gosh, I don't even know. Is, isn't that great? Like, I don't know how many white kids and black kids and, because they're proclaiming this, mm -hmm. this colorblindness. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know for a fact, because I've done experiments in other settings where I'll say, you know, uh, I'll pretend uh, that they're hooked up to lie detectors. I'll, I've, I've given them pins that I say have microchips in them to detect, you know, deception. Uh, and uh, then I ask them the same questions. And amazingly, they remember exactly <laughs> the racial makeup of their classes. So yeah. I don't think they're being honest. Mm -hmm. I think that they think that that's hip to sort of say, oh, I don't notice. But the truth is, like I said before, if you say you don't notice color, A, I don't believe you. But B, even if you were telling me the truth, the problem is the kids in your class are experiencing color. I mean, they're experiencing what it is to be black or to be Latino or to I mean, think about Arizona right now. Mm -hmm. You know, to say that if I'm a white teacher in the state of Arizona, oh, I don't notice color. That's great. Your brown kids certainly do because they are now going to be subjected to being asked by police fairly randomly whether or not they even belong in the country. Yeah. So if, if I've got if I'm a teacher and my kids are experiencing that and I don't know that and I don't really understand what that's about or I'm not open to having the conversation with that kid when that kid needs to talk to me, not about the math lesson, not about the history lesson or whatever it is we're teaching, but just about living in Tucson or living in Phoenix or living in Tempe or whatever. Um, I'm not going to be able to serve that kid's need. So the problem with colorblindness is, you know, first off, that it's not genuine. We, we do notice color. Every bit of research says we notice it. Yes. Um, and secondly, that it's not the goal. In fact, colorblindness makes it harder to deal with the consequences of color precisely because we are downplaying it. I mean, there was a study actually done, what, last month at the University of Illinois that, that found a brilliant study by a scholar who discovered that... Uh, that actually it's the people who claim to be colorblind who actually score high on a test of colorblindness who were the most willing to, to, to accept racist jokes, racist mm. statements. Gotcha. They, they think the least about, like when there's one of these mm. racist mm. parties that have happened on college mm. campuses, mm. Uh, you know, like blackface incidents mm. or ghetto parties and fraternities. Mm. It's the colorblind white kids who act like that's not a big deal because what they're doing is they're saying, well, I don't notice color, so nobody else should, so big deal if they're dressed up in blackface, it doesn't mean anything. So colorblindness actually is making them more accepting of blatant racism, ironically. Yeah, interesting. Talked about the students. How about the principals, superintendents, and governing boards? Well, I think that that's where it really gets difficult because what we do know on the one hand is that uh, good principals can make for excellent schools. I mean, if you have a principal who's really hands-on and really involved in the classrooms and really going in and checking on what's being done in those classrooms, giving constant feedback to teachers, giving constant encouragement to kids, it can turn a school around in a couple of years. I mean, there's plenty of evidence of that. There's a, a school in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee, that uh, had been on the, you know, on the list for basically almost about to be taken over under NCLB by the feds. And they got a new principal in, young black guy, brilliant, brilliant scholar, and just amazing personality who would go into the, he goes into the classroom every day, every class. He visits every class every day, is constantly on top of stuff, and it's turned that school around. Mm. It's not the teaching to the test that's done it. It's mm. not the mm. sort of rote memorization. Right. It's this hands-on approach. But that's very rare. And so the thing is, do we have principals who see themselves as sort of CEOs, which I think is a very dysfunctional model, which is this idea of I'm the person in charge. You know, I'm the person who makes the rules and I sort of sit in my office and answer the phone and just hang out or whatever, which is, I think, a very common thing. Or do we have principals who see themselves as an extension of the classroom teacher? Do, do principals who see themselves as certainly organizing the classroom efforts and they're, and, they're, and they're somewhat above it in the sense of coordinating. But they, but they see themselves as an extension of it. They are involved in the day-to-day -day operation of what goes on in that classroom. And I think if you have principals who have that understanding, particularly when it comes to race, they can make a huge difference in some of these schools that have been struggling for years with inadequate resources, with tracking, with disparate discipline. I mean, they can come in and make a difference. The problem is that an awful lot of folks at that administrative level have uh, really not been any better trained than the teachers mm -hmm. have been, and right. sometimes worse mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, at least the teachers have gotten gotten fairly recent pedagogical training. A lot of the administrators, the last pedagogical training they got was 15 or 20 years mm -hmm. ago. They've been in the classroom. Mm -hmm. They've been out of the whole pedagogical mm -hmm. training piece for at least 15, 20 years. So whatever they did learn, they've forgotten. 
and they don't necessarily, they're not expected to go back and sort of revisit those issues the way that teachers are more often. I mean, in-service training is for teachers typically, right. not for administrators. Exactly. Affirmative action is still just this huge trigger word in our vocabulary. Right. And, and, I, and I hear it once again, you know, either in the corporate sector or in the private sector, so forth, you know, that there is this disdain for this. Why is affirmative action still needed in the United States? Well, it's, first off, it's just amazing that it's still an issue at all. Because, in fact, I was in California uh, about a month ago, and and you know, was getting this question from students about, you know, what about affirmative action? And I, I, you know, sort of glibly responded that I found it fascinating that these students are in a state where affirmative action has basically been outlawed for mm -hmm. their entire educational life. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, 1996 is when Prop 209 passed. Mm -hmm. So these kids are in college, it's 2010, it's 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if they're sophomores, their entire mm -hmm. educational experience, there has been no affirmative action right. in California, but they are apparently of the opinion that it's still operating. Yeah. It's like people that didn't get yes. the word that we had welfare reform, they didn't get the word that we had all these laws change, they still think we're living in a world of you know what they perceive to have been racial preference on the right. part of, of the state. Now, of right. course, we know that that never was really true, but that was the impression. So I just find that fascinating. Um, I mean, the reason it's necessary is the same reason it was necessary 20 years ago when it was actually being done, or 15 years ago when it was actually being done, or 30 years ago when it was actually being done, which is that institutionalized white preference, institutionalized white privilege, institutionalized affirmative action for the dominant group is still very much the norm. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to try to get rid of what the critics of affirmative action call racial preference, that's fair enough, that's fine, <laughs> but you've got to start with the initial racial preference. Exactly. You don't start with the remedy mm. and say, we're going to get rid of this kind, mm -hmm. but not address this kind, or mm. even worse, we're going to ignore this mm. kind, we're going to deny this kind even exists, mm -hmm. we're just going to deal with this piece. Um, that's what we've done. We, we've banned or restricted affirmative action for people of color, but we're not doing that for white folks. So in, in the wake of the Supreme Court decision in 03, for example, which restricted what colleges could do, um, yeah, they put the they put the sort of kibosh on uh, on affirmative action as we think of it, which is for people of color. But they left in place all the preferences for the children of alums in Michigan, which is where that case came out of. They said, for example, uh, we want to get rid of special points for people of color, but now we're going to keep the special points for people who are from the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is a very white part of the state. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep the extra points for people who had AP classes, mm -hmm. which of course in this country are three times more prevalent at white schools mm -hmm. than at mostly schools of color. We're going to keep the points for people that um, went to the schools that graduate the highest percentage of students, which are usually affluent schools, also white. So in effect, we're going to leave in place all the white preferences. We're just going to deal with the other kind, which is of course you know, profoundly hypocritical. So it's, it's necessary for the same reason it always was, that, that affirmative action for whites has been the norm, it's been the history, it is still the norm, and none of the assaults on affirmative action for people of color even take that into account. Mm -hmm. I often tell my students the first affirmative action policy was the Constitution of the United States. And it actually goes back further than that. I mean, the one I, the one I mentioned, and, and because it's relevant to my family, you know, I have some family that didn't come here until the early 1900s, but I have other family that came here in the 1600s in the colonial period. The first affirmative action program was actually a thing called the Headright Program, which mm. was which most of us never learned about in school. Mm. I never learned about it until five or six years ago, and I was doing research for for my uh, for my memoir, and I was looking up family stuff, and I was looking at the history of what was going on at the time that some of my family came. And I have a you know seventh or eighth degree great grandfather who came here in the 1630s, um, right before the English Civil War and when the immigration was shut down for a period of time uh, from England. And at that time, the colonies had a thing called, particularly Virginia, um, had a thing called the headright system whereby if you were a male head of household coming from England, which is to say that you were white, obviously, right. um, you would be able to get 50 acres of land and the tools to work the land for free just for making the trip. And my seventh degree or whatever it was, great-grandfather, was able to take advantage of this program. Mm. Now that is a huge, I mm -hmm. mean, if we were to do a program to give 50 acres, not 40 acres in a mule, right, now, right. 50 acres and a mule, so to speak, to people of color, we would call that welfare. We would call that affirmative mm -hmm. action. We would call that racial mm -hmm. preference. We would call it everything mm -hmm. but what we did for white folks, which was nation building, right. was the terminology that we used. And, and the same thing with the Homestead Act, or as you said, the Constitution, the Naturalization Act of 1790, first law passed by the Congress after the right. Constitution passes, says all, all free white folks and only free white folks are citizens. 
That's a huge aspect of affirmative yes. action. I mean, and that remained the case for 70 years or so until black folks were included. And then, right. you know, Asian Americans and Native Americans were not included in citizenship until the 20th century, right. which most people don't know. So. Yeah, amazing. Had a young uh, student, um, actually wasn't that young, actually a teacher who said, my fear of diversity is that I'm losing my culture. Okay, and of course I asked her what she meant by right. my culture, and right. essentially she meant white culture. Right. What's the fear? I don't know what white culture is, first of all. I mean, <laughs> that's the question I guess I would have for someone like that is, right. what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, you know, um, because I, I know about my family's different cultures, mm -hmm. although I don't know as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And I would say the reason I don't know as much as I could is precisely because whiteness came and took all that away. Mm -hmm. Like, my, my actual historical culture is Anglo-Scottish on one side um, and, and uh, 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 Eastern European Jew really on the other side. And I don't know enough about either of those, but the reason is that when my people came, whether it was in the 1630s or the 19 teens, um, it was that the price of the ticket, as James Baldwin said, was to become white yeah. was to give up all that. Yeah. So in a sense, what this teacher is telling you is a real pain and it's a real loss, but mm. she or he is misidentifying mm. where the loss comes from mm. and what the source of the injury is. The source of the injury is not diversity. The source of the injury is not multiculturalism. Mm. The source of the injury is whiteness. Mm. Whiteness is what takes all these European people and says, whatever language you were speaking, forget that. Whatever your cultural heritage was, forget that. You're white now. My great-grandfather came here from Russia in, in 1907 and uh, had no idea what it was to be white, never heard that term, that wasn't what he was, he was just Jew, he was just a Jewish immigrant. Um, but very shortly, as the Irish did, as the Italians did, you learn that to be white is a whole nother team, now you gotta get oh, yeah. with this team. So don't speak Yiddish, and surely don't teach your kids Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Don't teach your kids Italian, you mm -hmm. know, and so if you ask, man, I've gone into these very ethnic communities. I've gone into, uh, uh, you know, Bensonhurst in, in Brooklyn, which is an Italian American community historically. I've gone into South Boston, in, 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 which is a historically Irish American right. community. And I've asked, quote unquote, white folks there, what does it mean to be Irish? Or what does it mean to be Italian? And the sad answer that you get from people, particularly if they're under 50, yeah. they're older, they sort of got a clue, right. they got a right. sense. But if they're under 50, their whole answer is like, literally, it comes down to food, family, and faith. Well, what is that? Like mm -hmm. food, everybody eats. Every, you know, 90% of Americans have some kind of faith in a higher power or God of some sort. And we all got folks, we all got family. So if that's what makes you Irish, if that's what makes you Italian, then we're all Irish and we're all Italian, but we're not. So, I mean, my guess is their great grandparents would have been like, what the hell are you saying? That's it? Like there's more to it than that, but we don't know. So I think that the teacher who said that to you is right but they are missing the source of the injury. And I said that to a young man several years ago. There was a guy who showed up at one of my talks. He was a overt neo-Nazi who made it real clear. I mean, he had yeah. swastikas on his right, right. jacket. It wasn't real hard to right. discern. But his whole thing, he brought this up in the Q&A after my talk, he made the same argument. He said, uh, you know, I'm Scandinavian or my Norwegian on one side of my family, and why is it that I can't celebrate that without being thought of as racist? And my argument was, I think it's great if you want to celebrate that. Yeah. The problem is that ain't whiteness. Like your Scandinavian heritage, your Norwegian heritage, that's real. Like that's deep. That's that's heavy. Yeah. I would like for you nice. to learn that and teach me because I don't know anything about that. Nice. But when you when you cleave to whiteness mm. as some identifier that you think makes you better, you actually get further away from the very thing that you want to remember. And so it seems to me you ought to be angry at the same thing I'm angry at, which is white supremacy and white privilege, because the more, the deeper you get into that, the further you get away from the thing that actually makes you who you are. And of course, he didn't understand what the hell I was talking about, but I tried, you know, I tried. I did the best I could. So. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. a great answer for it. Oh, we've got to talk about Brother Obama. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lots of different spin. I mean, one certainly is this very interesting undercurrent that we see, I think, sweeping the nation in terms of the incivility uh, that's taking place, um, spitting on congressmen, you know, defaming people because of their sexual orientation, so forth. Yeah, we're so keeping on. it classy. That's how we do. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah, that's good yeah, stuff. real good. Um, just, just pure race. I think that. Um, a lot of it is, I, I think that white America is, um, and I'm using that term in the corporate sense, obviously not to refer to all white people, but, but that white America is sort of in the midst of this perfect storm of racial anxiety. And, it's, and it's four, there are four elements to the storm, right? One 
is the presence of a, of a president of color, which on one level for some white folks is hard to digest because we've been so accustomed to seeing leadership as right. white and male, of yes. course, um, that to have anybody who challenges that image is, is complicated for some mm -hmm. folks. The second thing is, of course, the economic meltdown and the fact that white folks for the first time in three generations, really going all the way back to the Depression, are looking at double-digit unemployment. Now, that's that's normal for black and brown folks, yeah. but for white folks, that is a, a new thing. Yeah. So there's a certain degree of anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. The third thing, of course, is the demographic uh, transition in the country generally. You know, uh, Within 30 years, whites will be, according to all the evidence, about half the population and half will be people of color. For a lot of white folks, if you grow up with that sense of normalcy where you think, I am what an American is. I am the prototype. I am the definition. If you looked in a dictionary, you'd see me. Like, I am the norm. To now have to share that definition of what an American is with people who look a lot different, whose names are a lot different, who maybe pray differently, whose mm -hmm. languages of origin were not yours. Mm -hmm. For a lot of white folks, that's hard to swallow. And then the yeah. final thing is popular culture. You have a popular culture that is thoroughly multicultural to the point where you can't really even separate the threads of that culture mm -hmm. without the whole thing coming apart. You have hip hop artists that are making records with country artists. You have people that are you know, doing movies and music and they're all sort of hanging out together. And so for a lot of white folks who were used to looking at popular culture as reflecting them, you know, it was it was they it was Rock Hudson and it was and it was, uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe and it was the Beatles and it was, of course, the Beatles borrowed by their own by their own admission and gave a lot of credit to black artists. But white folks were able to look at white music, white actors, white personalities as being them, as being connected to them. And now when you look out, and you see that you know, the popular culture doesn't always look like you anymore, doesn't always sound like you. For some people, that's hard to get your head around. So when those four things come together, pop culture, black president, demographic transition, economic meltdown, I think what it does is for white folks who have had the privilege of taking for granted our centrality and our normalcy and our sense of being the norm, um, to all of a sudden not be able to take that for granted, to not be able to say, I am America, you know, is... Um, is causing some folks to just pop off and, and, and to engage in this kind of rhetoric about, I want my country back. Because, you know, for people of color, they've never been able to take for granted that they were the norm. And they learned to deal with that. Mm -hmm. You know, black and brown folks from day one had to deal with the fact that they weren't going to be the norm. They weren't going to be the majority, that they just had to learn to deal and survive. But for white folks, that sense of, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I am America, man. You know, mm -hmm. like even the term all-American boy, all-American girl, mm -hmm. I still, I do, I do word association exercises with people in mm -hmm. workshops. And when you throw those terms out, even the folks of color, um, certainly the white folks, but mm -hmm. even the folks of color will, if they're being honest, yeah. and most will be, if you're, if, you're, if you're straight with them and tell them what you want to do, mm -hmm. uh, will admit that what they envision mm -hmm. right, is a white person, and not just a white person, mm -hmm. but like a white person with blonde hair and blue oh, eyes. Yeah. Well, that is not the norm anymore. It really isn't. In a lot of communities, it hasn't been the norm for years. Right. In some communities, it still is. In 30 years, it ain't going to be the norm anywhere. Mm -hmm. And yet white folks are very slow to adapt to that recognition that um, we're not necessarily the prototype any longer. And I think that that's why you see some of these folks who are you know, sort of in this nostalgic frame mm. where they want to take things back to what they consider right. to be a time that was more innocent, more, more decent, and where they frankly could take their own normalcy for granted. You know? if, if I'm in a community that is um, changing, okay, how do we stop that? Should we stop that? Are we talking about now just really choice? I mean, there was a time when it was, you know, we had the signs up, you know, you don't belong here, but we've taken those signs down. We put dollar signs up. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we're, we're segregating ourselves yeah. again. Well, I mean, people are obviously, they're going to do what they're going to do, and they're going to exercise their choice. You mentioned white flight earlier. People are going to engage in that. Now, what's interesting is we're sort of seeing some reverse white flight. We're seeing two trends right now, right? We're seeing reverse white flight, which is white folks, particularly younger folks, who, whose families maybe moved to the burbs, but now they're all wanting to be hip and cool and, and ironic and I don't know what they're trying to be, like moving back to the city and taking advantage of the proximity to hipness and coffee shops and <laughs> wine bars and whatever, yeah. which is all good, except that what happens is when a lot of this reverse white flight happens, of course, the people who are coming back are not mindful enough. I mean, good for them that they're not trying to run. Right, That's awesome. Right. But the problem is they're not being mindful enough of the impact that 
a mass influx of more affluent white folks has on the community that was always there. I mean, if you had a bunch of affluent, you know, disposable income having white folks move into the city where folks have been struggling, what's going to happen? The rents are going to go up. The property taxes are going to go up. So a lot of the older folks in particular who have been there the whole time trying to slug it out and survive are not even going to be able to afford to stay. So I think it's important if you're going to move back to the city from the burbs, that's fantastic because I got no love for the suburbs, frankly. It's not my thing. But if you're going to move back to the city, you have some obligations like to think about, okay, what is my impact? When I go back into the city, what do I need to be thinking about? What what do I need to get involved in? If people in the community have been struggling around police brutality, job creation, failing schools, how can I tap into that? How can I be an ally? How can I work in solidarity with people? If you're willing to do that, that reverse white flight it can be a positive thing. Otherwise, it becomes just gentrification and it becomes very destructive. Um, the other trend, of course, is that you still have some people who are definitely not doing that, who are doing the opposite, who were like, oh God, the suburbs are too black now, I gotta run even further, right? So now we're into this exurb, right? Which is a term that I don't even think existed 10 years ago. It's some <laughs> made up word, right. right? Exurb meaning this area that we would have just called the country when I was a kid, right? But now it's like an outer ring area mm-hmm. that uh, is way the hell out, way out. away from the city. Sure. And and you know, there comes a point where, I mean, we have a fixed land mass. Like, you can only run so far. Idaho's only got so much acreage, you know. Um, Montana, you know, has already been jacked it's from indigenous up pretty people. Good. And yeah, it's going to fill up. Sure. And, yeah. and so the truth is that um, we're going to see these trends probably continue. You're going to see some white folks who are going to keep on running. You're going to see other white folks who do the opposite of running, who come back but, but inadvertently take up so much space that it can still be oppressive to people of color. The real question is what those of us who are committed to justice do with both of those groups, which is to say, if we are a white person, for example, or a person of color in these exurban areas or suburban areas, are we challenging the folks who were there around these issues, maybe in ways they've never been challenged before. If we are living in the city and we see these folks moving back, are we gonna challenge them around accountability or are we just gonna be so grateful that they're moving back to the city that we ignore that? And that's my concern. Cause you see a lot of these young people going back teaching in schools. So we're talking about education. A lot of them, oh, I wanna teach, you know, they do TFA, they do Teach for America. Right. They do all this stuff where they get really involved in, right. in various service projects that maybe have some decent intrinsic value, but unless they have done their homework unless they really understand the way that those arrangements can become colonial. The fact that they're in proximity. I mean, look, slave owners lived really close to their property and it didn't change the dynamic. And um, though I don't want to overstate and, and say that, you know, gentrification equals enslavement, the reality is proximity doesn't necessarily get you off the hook of being racist or doing things that are racist or classist in effect. You have to really engage the issues. I'm a um, freshman, 17, 18 years old. Right. I've lived in the comfort of the suburbs. I'm coming to the university for the first time. I'm dealing with a, you know, a diversity that I've never faced mm. before. What's my first step to becoming conscious? What's my first step to taking that journey um, to consciousness. Are you white in this scenario? And I'm, I'm okay, white. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just want to make. Yeah, sure. need, needed uh, to get yeah. that. I, I think um, I think the first step, and and you know, for some folks it's really tough. For other folks, it's not. And this is what's I think hopeful about this is I meet a lot of young people who are who are okay with taking this if they just have the means to do it. Is to be open to acknowledging all the stuff you don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that seventeen and eighteen year olds are generally open to admitting there's a lot they don't know. That's why they go to college. I mean, after all, you don't go to college to just, I hope, to reinforce all the stuff you think you already know. That's a waste of time and money. You you go because there's there's this whole world that you're hoping to have opened up to you. So, I mean, I can certainly recall as a freshman and, and with a lot of first year students who I meet, they're very open, but you have a very small window of time before their openness tends to start closing up again. Because once you get closer to graduation, once you get closer to going out in the quote unquote real world, now you, you, you know, you, you're, you're less open to new stuff because you just gotta focus. You gotta focus on succeeding or getting a good job or getting into the right grad school or whatever. And I think um, for those young people, and really preferably before first year of college, preferably in high school, but I realize it doesn't always happen, it's important to hit them with the idea that there's so much they don't know. And part of what they don't know 
is related to their identity. That is to say that to be white is to mean you're going to have certain blind spots around race. To be upper middle class, you're going to have blind spots around class. To be a man, you're going to have blind spots around sex and gender. Yeah. To be straight, you're going to have blind spots around sexuality and sexual orientation. And, and all of these different identities are going to affect what you know and what you don't know, what you've seen and what you haven't seen, and what you're likely to understand. It's not about saying, oh, well, you're white, therefore you're ignorant. It's about saying, well, you're white, therefore these are things you would not have ever had to probably think about unless you had a really great teacher or parents who were really, you know, sort of on top of it, which most people haven't had uh, to be able-bodied you know is the most obvious example there are lots of things that I don't have to think about that people with disabilities have to think about every hour of their lives yes. in order to overcome obstacles the fact that I don't think about those things doesn't make me a bad person yeah. but it means that I have the luxury or the privilege or the advantage of being oblivious to the reality that other people have so that's what I think schools want to convey is that your identity on all these different levels you got you know 10 or 15 different possible levels possibly um, makes it where some people are going to have some insights that you're not going to have and you're going to have some that they're not going to have and the key is figuring out how we can share those insights so that we can both gain from them so we can all gain from them and I think that young people are open to that if schools are prepared to challenge them with that directly and not just assume they're going to get that in the classroom because some will and some won't. Right. You know, some students will take classes where identity is engaged directly mm -hmm. and others won't and I don't think it should be up to chance. I think this is stuff that every young person has got got to be prepared to think about if they're going to be functional in a multicultural democracy and in a country where, again, in 30 years, whiteness is not going to be the norm and where globally it's already not the norm. So right. you need to adapt. You needed to adapt 20 years ago, let alone 20 years from now. You, you have two young children. I do. What are you doing to help make sure that they're ready for this world you just described? Well, you know, it's, it's complicated because, I mean, on the one hand, you know, you I know all the research, I know what it says. I know that the research says that children, particularly white children, who oftentimes don't receive a lot of information about race, most white parents don't talk to their kids about race. Now obviously I'm not gonna be one of those parents, but, um, but just because I know that's not what you're supposed to do doesn't mean it's easy for me to do it. Right. Just because I know what to do doesn't mean that it's something that's like you know walking across the street. It's mm. complicated because you realize that there are age appropriate levels at which to introduce things. And so with us, what I try to do is, is a couple of things. I mean, strategically, number one is to take advantage of the moments when they arise. And they arise often. I mean, it might be you know uh, watching a Disney film. It might be watching a television show. It might be you know looking at some of the stuff they're learning in school or during the celebration of a particular holiday or doing you know, talking about things where all of a sudden we have an entry point to talk about racism and discrimination. Um, it doesn't mean that like on Tuesday morning my kid wakes up, we have breakfast, and I'm like, hey, let's talk about mm -hmm. white privilege today. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But 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 taking advantage of the opportunities when they arise being prepared for them and being being prepared to sort of move into that conversation um, with your kids at a pretty early age. We know the research says that that's critical. And then I think the second thing strategically is to engage in sort of a question and answer process with kids. So, you know, you ask questions of them to try to elicit answers that will let you know, first of all, where they're at in their mind and then bring them to where you want them to be. Because, you know, with kids, it's always easier if they think they thought of it yeah. rather than if you just hit them with it. I mean, I always joke about how if I want my kid to brush her teeth in the morning, the oldest one in particular, um, if I tell her, get upstairs and brush your teeth, she never wants to do it. If I ask her, what are you supposed to be doing right now? 80% of the time, she'll say, brushing my teeth, right? And then she'll go do it because mm. she thinks she came up with that. Mm. So she thinks she's a genius. Mm. If it works, it works. And so with race, what we did, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, my kids were not quite five and, uh, and, and not quite three or maybe six and four. I can't remember. Um, say almost six and almost four is what it was. And uh, we were sitting around one day, nothing to do, raining outside, wanted to watch a movie on TV ordered up a you know, $4.99 satellite movie, and it was um, Evan Almighty, which is the comedy with Steve Carell and Morgan Freeman, right. and Steve Carell plays the senator, uh, Morgan Freeman plays God, God tells the senator that a flood is coming and he should build an ark. You know, it's the Noah and the ark story basically retold for the modern era, and it's funny. The kids had seen it before with my wife, so they didn't really want to watch it again, but they recognized the trailer, and because they recognized it, it got their attention. The little one looks up and says, is that God? Because she doesn't know any better. The older one looks and says, and laughs at her and says, that can't be God. 
And when I asked her why not, right, the answer was because God isn't black, God is white. So in that moment, I knew that I had to, because I mean, we don't have any racialized images of God in our house. Yeah. We don't have any of the iconography that would suggest that divinity was white or racialized at all. So where's she getting that? I mean, I know it's obviously she's picking it up somewhere, but I had to find out what was going on. So I asked her a series of questions. First question was, why do you say that? She says, oh, I don't know. I said, well, let's, let's think about it, you know, because what I've learned is you can go deep with kids. You just can't stay very long because their attention span is very limited. So you got to get in and get out. So the first question I asked was, well, what do you think God did? What, what, what's the story, yeah. you know? And she said, well, God made everything. I said, okay, so God made people? She goes, yeah, 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 God made people. I said, well, okay, so where were the first people? Because I knew that she had studied that in preschool. They'd had a big map on the wall. It showed you know, humanity emanating from Africa and spreading out. So I knew she knew that the first folks were from Africa. And so I asked her, she said, Africa, right? I said, yeah. I said, so what do Africans look like? She said, well, they're black, right? I said, yeah, okay, so let's review. God made people. First people are in Africa, Africans are black. Now, in whose image were those people made? And at first it confused her because hmm. she's a bright kid, but she's not a biblical scholar. She goes, what, what do you mean? I said, well, now the story is that God made people in the image of something, in the image of what? She said, oh, oh, in the image of God. I said, okay, so once again, let's review. God makes people, first people are African, Africans are black, they're made in the image of God. Final question, what color is God? And she looked around, she had this you know, very contemplative look, and she finally said, I don't know, I guess maybe God can be black. And I said, very good, let's watch a movie, right? That was the end of the conversation. But what was great about that was it was a way, to, and obviously I don't think God is white, black, or any other sort of racialized anthropomorphic thing, but, but it was just critical to sort of debunk the racial conditioning. And it worked because she goes, oh, okay, I guess. And eight months later, she comes to me at breakfast one day. and We hadn't talked about this since. And she says, Daddy, do you really think God could be black? <laughs> I said, I don't know. What do you think? She goes, I don't know. Maybe so. I said, very good. Have some cereal. You know, that was it. But, but that question yeah. and answer process, instead of me saying mm. in the wake of her making that comment about Morgan Freeman can't be God because God isn't black, I could have just said, well, now that's ridiculous. You know, I could have gotten all really sort of haughty and didactic and just told her what I wanted her to know. Right. Or I could sort of lead her as a child, which she was and is, to the process of thinking through what it is you believe and and that's not and, and that's so much more helpful because yeah. it doesn't just tell you what to think it tells you how to think right. and i think I, you know if you learn how to think you're not going to fall into racist patterns because learning how to think is going to steer you away from the kind of overly simplistic stereotypical racist thinking that's so common it's because we don't learn how to do that that we fall into that trap gotcha so let's talk about those who have fallen into the trap yeah so what do we do with the Rush Limbaugh's, whose Kool-Aid is must be awful tasty because people are drinking it by the gallons. Right. So how do we counter that power of, 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 of that new profit? I'm not really worried about the Rush Limbaugh's, to be honest. I mean, I do. I worry about them uh, because they can do immense damage and they have an inordinate influence relative to what they actually have to offer. Right. Um, but I, I think there are two things, right? Number one is realizing that as, as, as appealing as it is to divide ourselves into the good and the bad people and say Limbaugh's bad, Glenn Beck's bad, uh, Sean Hannity's bad, the Tea Party people are bad. I mean, are, are some of those people awful, horrible people? Well, sure. Uh, are, do Limbaugh and Beck and, and Hannity exploit racial resentment and fear quite deliberately, both for ratings and for political gain? Absolutely, and I've written about that. I've given example after example after example in my writing about how they do it. But to me, the issue is, and, and do some of those Tea Party folks bring overtly racist signs to their rallies? Absolutely. When you bring a picture saying, go back to Kenya, or, or you know, with the president with a bone through his nose, uh, dressed like a witch doctor, you're not going to convince me that you're not a racist, right. because that's what you are. Yeah. But, but, but the thing is, the white folks, for example, who are not in the Tea Party, who don't listen to Limbaugh, who don't listen to Beck, who actually don't like those guys, who actually voted for Obama, I think it's important to remember that there are millions of those people who still, by their own admission in polls and surveys, continue to adhere to overtly racist, stereotypical mm -hmm. views about black people. I mean, the survey data says, for example, going back 20 years, and as recent as just a few years ago, that between 60% at the bottom and 75% at the top 
of white Americans are willing to admit to pollsters that they continue to believe at least one racist thing, if not several, mm. about black folks. Now, by definition, if you're willing, now that's how many will admit it. Mm. We know the research says lots of folks won't admit their biases because right. we know that they don't sound really good to acknowledge that. So you got to figure 60 percent will own it. 80% are thinking it. And a lot of other research says that, right? That 85, 90% of whites have internalized what are called implicit or subconscious biases against black folks and in favor of whites. Other research has found 95% of whites, when asked to envision a drug user, envision a black person, even though the typical drug user is white. Yeah. Uh, when they do MRI studies, they hook white folks up to MRIs, show them a subliminal image of a black male on a computer that's flashed for 30 milliseconds, so it's not even long enough to register with your conscious brain, the part of the brain that lights up, having seen the subconscious image, is the part that responds to fear, anxiety, and yeah. threat of, threat of uh, violence. So something's going on with folks, yeah. and not all those folks are right wing. A lot of those folks had to have voted for Obama by definition, or he couldn't have won. So as I talk about in some of my work, I, I, to me, we need to recognize that it's not just racism 1.0, which is old school. Uh, classic racism, which right. we all recognize right. when we see it. It's racism 2.0. It's the kind that allows millions of white people to still hold on to racist views about blacks and other people of color, but be willing to carve out exceptions for that guy, meaning mm -hmm. Barack Obama, or that woman, meaning Oprah Winfrey, or that sports star, or that entertainer. I can't tell you how many times I've met white folks whose views about the larger black community are horribly racist, but yet they still got posters of black entertainers on their wall, yeah. they yeah. listen to yes. black music, yes. they vote for Obama, <laughs> yeah. and in fact, I voted for Barack Obama is sort of becoming, for some of those folks, the new, some of my best friends are black, mm -hmm. right? right? That's my get out of jail free card because yeah. I voted for Obama, so how can I be racist? So I think it's important to remember that two things, right? Conservatives are right when they say that not all of them are racist for having voted against Obama. That's true. And not all the folks who voted for Obama can get off the hook for being racist. You don't, you don't get to avoid your own. I mean, I think we've all, to some extent, fallen into that trap. And the question is, are we willing to acknowledge it? You know, the difference between Sonia Sotomayor, now Supreme Court Justice, and all the other justices on the court, particularly the way, and, and then the white men in the Senate who didn't want to confirm her, but ultimately did, and who were grilling her during that confirmation hearing, is that she was the only one willing to acknowledge that she had a lens. Mm. You know, her whole thing was, I see the world as a Latina. Mm. I see the law mm. through the lens of a Latina. I bring that lens to the process. That's honesty. Mm -hmm. The difference is the white men who attacked her for saying that won't acknowledge they have a lens. Their whole yeah. thing is, why can't you be neutral like me? Right. Why can't you be objective and see the world, you know, objectively in blank mm. slate the way I do? Which of course is totally absurd because they do see it as white people and as men. The difference is they won't own that. They won't admit that, which means they will be led around the chessboard by their conditioning without even realizing it's happening. Whereas Sonia Sotomayor, the research would indicate, because she's willing to own her own lens and her own biases, she will probably work harder to keep those biases from working in an unfair way. So what we need to do is own our stuff, not deny it, not run away from it, not act like it's not in us, admit that it is part of who we are, but that we don't want to let it be the controlling part. What are you hopeful about? Well, I mean, I, I, there's part of me that doesn't like to use the word hope because um, in addition to it just being overused, I think it's also, sometimes it can be very passive and, and uh, as Derek Jensen says, it, it, it causes us to give up our agency in a sense. Like for example, if my kids were hungry, if they were starving, I would not hope that we would find food mm. I would go find food. Mm. And if I had to steal it to get it, I would do it, right? So hope can be one of those things that's so passive, we just wait for things to happen, as opposed to saying, no, 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 we're gonna make justice happen. Now, I realize it's easier said than done, but I, I, I try to avoid words like hope because I think they can become um, excuses for inaction. And, and, and uh, nonetheless, I am hopeful to some extent in the sense that I do believe that people have an amazing capacity for decency. And I think that most people, white, black, or otherwise, are good folks. Now, I could be wrong about this. I could be very wrong. But as a parent of two children, I have a vested interest in believing this, so I'm just going to keep on believing it until proven otherwise. I think most people are good people, but I realize that good people can be easily led 
away from the better angels of their nature toward oppressive or discriminatory treatment of other human beings. And, and it's not that most people wake up wanting to oppress. I don't think most people do. I realize there's a, a small cadre of sociopathic individuals who don't care about the injury they do to others, but that's not most people. That's the good news. Most of us are not sociopaths. The bad news is, that those of us who are quote unquote good people, which again, I think is most people, unfortunately, sometimes it's the good people who are the least able to see the damage they do right. because we get so invested in our goodness that we can't imagine doing harm. And in fact, we so want to insulate ourselves from the idea that we might be hurting people. Uh, on racial levels or class levels or gender levels or whatever, that we just sort of push that you know, to the back of our mind or to the side and we don't think about it. And so I'm hopeful that we can rise above that, uh, above that tendency you know, to, to push it away. But I'm also um, skeptical about our likelihood of doing that right now mm -hmm. with the existing educational system that we have, with the existing uh, economic system, with the existing sort of systemic denial that is so prevalent in all of these institutions. I know we're capable of it, and that's what gives me hope, but I'm not seeing nearly enough of it in any of us right now. We need to step it up and do quite a bit better. Outstanding. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got it.